Welcome to today's first session. Today we're going to talk about something that is very unique to the Jewish people and the State of Israel. We call it a light unto nations. My name is Nama Klar. I'm the managing director of the Root Institute, an Israeli think and do tank that tried to tackle neglected problems of the State of Israel and the Jewish people. We've been working with the IAC for a couple of years now. We're very proud to be partners of this important organization. And today's session is going to work like this. We're going to have short TED Talks by three very interesting speakers. And then we're going to open it up for a conversation about how this tikkun, tikkun olam initiatives, how this light onto the nation's role and aspiration can talk into the, what we're trying to build here now, the Jewish communities, the Israeli-American communities, and how does it all come together. Before we're starting, there is a very fundamental question of why should we deal with this issue to begin with? So I would like to suggest that we should talk about tikkun olam, not just because it's a Jewish value that comes from our Jewish heritage, but also because it proposes opportunities for the State of Israel and for the Jewish people to improve their international standing to create new opportunities that can be also translated into new markets and economic opportunities. And it can also, and maybe most importantly, be a basis for a shared global Jewish identity, which is highly needed nowadays. There's so much potential in the field of tikkun olam, of humanitarian aid, of improving the world and improving our societies. This potential sometimes gets lost in translation. There are a lot of efforts decentralized, not talking to each other. Often, the state of Israel and Jewish communities find it hard to work together around the, sh the same shared challenges. But the speakers we're going to hear today are a part of the solution rather than the problem. They are trying to be the new voice. They are trying to tap the potential that the Tikkun Olam initiative has for the Jewish people, for the State of Israel, and for the world. So with that note, I would like to present our first speaker, Ms. Sh Mrs. Shula Rekanati, the Chairperson of Education for Excellence. Good morning. I'm honored and pleased to be here at this very significant conference and with this very lovely crowd. I'm the chairperson of Educating for Excellence. Every person has life-defining moments, moments that change everything. My life-defining moment happened 17 years ago at a neglected basement in a poor neighborhood in Tel Aviv. I was invited to visit a unique social startup. As I entered the basement, I saw a group of children, some studying, some reading books, some engaged in activities such as painting and photography, and they were tutored by a small group of university students who received scholarships in return. What struck me most was seeing the enthusiasm, curiosity, joy, motivation, and above all, the sparkle in the children's eyes that captured my heart. I felt an immediate connection to this attempt to make a difference in the lives of disadvantaged children. This visit changed my life. It opened my eyes to the problem of social gaps in Israel and pushed me towards hands-on community involvement. As I walked out of the basement, I thought, this initiative is much too big for this small basement. And I felt I had to do something about it. I imagined how this young project could turn into a strong, influential organization which changes the lives of thousands of children in Israel. So I turned it into an NGO called Educating for Excellence, or E4E, Chinuch Lepsagot in Hebrew, and undertook its leadership as a chairperson. 
E4E strengthens Israeli society by reducing social gaps, promoting social mobility. How do we do that? We create equal opportunities for children with potential who come from disadvantaged environments. One such child is Mo. And to me, nothing tells the story of E4E better than his story. Mo comes from a poor family. His parents never finished high school, and no one expected him to get education. When Mo was a child, his, car was his father was disabled in a car accident, and his mother had to leave her job to take care of him. Needless to say, studying was the last thing on Moore's mind, and he spent more time in the streets than in the classroom. His school practically gave up on him. When we identified Moore's talents and need, we enrolled him in E4E, and everything changed. It was not an easy choice for Moore, because he did not see the benefits in studying. But he did join E4E at elementary school and began our program of 16 hours per week, all year round. And the rest is history. Moore's grades began to climb, and he reveled in the joy of self-improvement. He graduated from high school with honors and chose to enlist in the army in a meaningful position and became a combat officer. When he finished his military service with distinction, he was ready for his next challenge, which was academic excellence. Today, Moore is 26 years old, and he is in his second year of engineering in Ben Gurion University in Be'er Sheva, Israel. Yeah. Mo really deserves it, and I wish I could have bring him with me, but he is studying. Along his uh, long and challenging journey, E4E has always been there to guide, support, and empower him. In one of our recent conversations, Moore said to me, today I know that when there is a will, there is a way, and everything can be achieved with hard work and self-belief. Or in Hebrew, en davar haomed bifnei ratzon. And to think that Moore's inspiring story was close to never happening. But Moore is not alone. Like him, there are thousands of children in Israel who come from disadvantaged background and have huge potential for excellence. Moore realized his. But unfortunately, the majority of 850,000 children underneath the poverty line in Israel do not. Social gaps exist everywhere. A child born into poverty has a very little chance to break the poverty cycle. This is a global issue. Yet, I was shocked to find out that Israel suffers from the widest gaps and the greatest degree of poverty and inequality in the Western world. In fact, the widening social gaps are the number one threat to the sustainability of Israeli society. The United States suffer from wide gaps as well, and together we can try and cope with this issue. The key to change is creating social mobility. And the key to social mobility is education. By providing equal opportunities through education, children can succeed not based on the socioeconomic status of their parents, but thanks to their grit, hard work, and motivation. So how do, how do we create this basis for social mobility? We, at Educating for Excellence, developed a unique educational model, which is based on four crucial elements. Experiential learning, cultural enrichment, personal and collective empowerment, 
and instillment of values such as excellence and community outreach. We accompany our children from the age of eight until they are professional, employed young adult. It's quite a journey. Children are with us sometimes for until the age of 28 or 30. They are tutored by university students who receive scholarships. Families and schools are full partners, and we work very closely together. Our program creates a nurturing and a holistic environment which encourages a child to excel, to dare to dream, and to fulfill dreams. And to me, nothing is more moving than a child telling me, I never dared to dream. Now, I have so many dreams, I don't know where to begin. Our impact is outstanding. We have served over 2,500 children, tutored by 800 university students nationwide in over 40 centers of excellence. And look at our achievements in terms of high school graduation rate, Bagrut scores, and meaningful army service. Our students and graduates at the Orange exceed the national average on all the parameters. That's quite an accomplishment. We have already 350 graduates, like more, as well as Uri, who is served as an officer in Shmone Matayim and is today employed by a leading high-tech company, and Lisa, who graduated with a degree in bioinformatics and works in a, in a biotech startup in Israel. They have joined the startup nation. All our graduates are young, educated adults who believe in themselves and who strive to excel in everything they do. Many are leaders or change agents in their communities, and some come back to IFORI only this time as instructors and role models. I'm inspired by their accomplishments, and I'm so proud of them. They, for them, social mobility is not only an option, it's their reality. They broke out of the cycle of poverty and they prove that education indeed generates change. But we are just at the beginning because the best part is that our program is scalable. My dream is to reach out to all the children who need us in Israel, but not only in Israel, because our model, educational model, is universal and it can be replicated, adjusted, and applied anywhere, even here in the United States, and we can do it together. Our next step is increasing the impact to leverage our outcomes. To leverage the outcomes by creating coalitions and partnerships in order to strengthen Israel's future human capital. And remember, human capital is all we have in Israel. Our strategic goal is to reach 10,000 children in the next five years. To create a true impact, you need collaborations. There is no other way. With the government, with other NGOs, with foundations, with the social sector, with the business community, with academic institution, and with anybody who feels that they contribute, that they can contribute to this very important cause. If the story of E4E touches your heart, come, join us in increasing this impact. Let's talk about how you can get involved. My dream is to reach all the children that I believe we have to ensure that they can become who they want to become, just like Moore did, like Uri, 
like Lisa and all the rest of our graduates. Join us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shula Rekanati. I would like to invite Yotam Politzer, the co-CEO of Israel. Boker Tov, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. <clears throat> My humanitarian career started in this photo. This is a picture that I took four days after the tsunami in Japan, in Fukushima, where I came with an Israeli rescue and, and relief mission. And this is a town that was completely devastated by a 120-foot wave of tsunami. In the tsunami in Japan, just to remind all of us, more than 20,000 people lost their life. Half a million people lost their homes. And on top of that, you had the nuclear disaster. So where do you even start from? I stayed in Japan for free. It's not working? It's working? OK, good. I stayed in Japan for three years. I learned Japanese. And, you know, and, and we did a trauma counseling program for children that I'll talk about later. But my humanitarian career continued in this photo, which is in the Philippines in 2013, where also, in less than a week after the typhoon, I was there with a medical team from Israel. And then continued in the Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone, where I spent almost a year helping Ebola survivors. And you know, I always joke that my dream was to have my own private jet, but I didn't have the money, so I go to all these places that people are running away from. So in Japan, it was, it's a true story. In Japan, when we went to Fukushima, everyone was running away because of the radiation. So it was only me and four other Israelis on the plane. And in the Ebola, it was just me and one more doctor. And, and people ask me, weren't you scared? The truth is, I was terrified. And in the first three days, I didn't leave my hotel. And there was only one hotel operating in the country of Sierra Leone that time. When things were finally sort of relaxed and under control in the Ebola, I moved to Nepal. And I was there in less than 36 hours after the earthquake. Now, I didn't have time to tell you my background. But before joining Israel, I was working for another nonprofit in Nepal for three and a half years. And I learned a very useful language, Nepalese. I didn't think it would be useful, but it actually proved to be extremely useful during the earthquake in Nepal. And when the situation in Nepal was finally under control and on the right way to recovery, I moved to probably one of the biggest humanitarian disasters of our time, the Syrian refugee crisis. And my work with the Syrian refugees started in this photo in Greece, in the island of Lesbos, where every day we've seen five to 7,000 refugees arriving on these rubber boats. And you know, these boats were probably made to carry up to 30 people each, but we actually seen 150 people on a boat. I think the record number we counted on one boat was 153 men, women, elderly, disabled. And, and to add to this you know, lovely chaos, these refugees, many of them didn't know how to swim. And this orange life is that you've probably seen everywhere in the news, they received it by, from the Turkish smugglers that charged them $5,000 each to get on the boat. But these orange lifers were fake. The floating materials they have there was a sponge, but it didn't really work. So we lost in these 4.1 miles between Turkey and Greece more than 3,000 people just in the last two years. So it's really, you know, tragedy that's hard to grasp, and it's really overwhelming. But what I want to talk about today is actually not just the tragedy, because think about it. These people are coming from Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan. All of these are countries that don't have diplomatic relations with Israel. They've probably never seen a Jewish person in their life. And, and then the first people they see when they reach the coast of Greece are this group of Israelis. The organization is called Israel. The logo is the Star of David. So we always joke that they probably think they took the wrong boat. <laughs> they probably think they ended up in Haifa or Ashdod or Ashkelon or God knows where. But it's even more interesting because many of our staff and volunteers for the Syrian refugee crisis are actually Arab Israelis. So they speak their language. So they first go to the shore. They think they took the wrong boat. They see this big Star of David. These people from Israel are actually providing them with medical support. And many of them are actually speaking their language. So it's very confusing. But it's also an incredible opportunity 
to build bridges and to change people's perspective. But, you know, the, the refugee crisis is the biggest disaster of our time, but in the last two months, was, the last two months was probably the most intense period in the history of Israel and, and in my professional humanitarian career. It started in Houston in late August, where we sent a team of seven disaster responders from Israel just two days after the flooding. And I just came back from Houston yesterday, and we still have a team on the ground moving house to house and helping people uh, with the debris removal and with the cleaning efforts. And we actually have our team leader from Houston, Niv, say hi. Uh, he's here now. <laughs> Wait. It's just starting. Thank you. A week, a week after, Florida, another hurricane, Hurricane Irma. So we sent another team from Israel to help with the cleaning efforts in, in the Keys in Florida. A week after, the, er the earthquake in Mexico. So we sent a team of Spanish-speaking Israelis who are trauma specialists to help children who lost their parents and lost their homes cope with the trauma using art therapy. And this is actually a technique that was developed to help children in Sderot to cope with the ongoing bombing from Gaza. And then Puerto Rico. And Puerto Rico was a big mess and is still an ongoing disaster. And the airport was shut down, so we had to hire a plane. And we brought a team of water engineers from Israel. And we actually didn't have enough people ready to go in Israel, but we had a team in Haiti that's still working in Haiti for eight years after the earthquake. So we sent our team from Haiti and from Israel to Puerto Rico. And we're using this soya water filters that was developed by an Israeli um, uh, Israeli water technology company, and um, it costs only $50 each filter, and it's good for 25 people. It's providing enough clean water for 25 people. So what our team is doing in Puerto Rico right now is this kind of session. This is actually a picture from last week where our water engineer is actually training the local community how they could use these water filters and have access to clean water. But now another scale of disaster in Bangladesh I don't know if you heard about the Rohingya refugees. So the Rohingya are Muslim minority group from Myanmar, Burma. They really suffered an ethnic cleansing. And just in the last month, 600,000 people fled from Myanmar to Bangladesh. Bangladesh is another country where Israel don't have diplomatic relations. So this is one of the few places where we don't wear these t-shirts. But we did send a team of Israelis with an American passport who went there to provide relief. And they're there on the ground right now. And me, I was chasing disasters. I was doing this work for 10 years. But I became the co-CEO of Israel last February. So I'm now based in our nice office in Tel Aviv University, trying to monitor and, and supervise this um, incredible response, because we have teams in 19 countries right now, as we speak. And, and I was just visiting our US office in Palo Alto, in California, giving some presentations and meetings. And, and I was about to visit our program in Mexico. I actually had a flight ticket to Mexico to join the earthquake response team. But then we heard about the wildfires in California, in, in Sonoma and Napa. And I literally did a U-turn on the way to the airport and went up to the city of Santa Rosa. Where, and I got in touch with the Jewish community there because um, 40 members of the Jewish Reform Synagogue lost their homes. Two members of the community died in the terrible fires. And that's what I've seen. And, and I've seen a lot of stuff in my life, but that was unbelievable. In California, all these whole neighborhoods burned to the ground. And we actually helped the Jewish community, and we turned this evacuation center, this, uh, sorry, this synagogue into an evacuation center um, that's still operating now for people who lost their homes. So it's really overwhelming, and, and I'm always asking when I give this presentation, and I give it to you know, Harvard and Stanford and all these brilliant schools. And I asked the students, these very smart students, what is the first thing you do when you get to these disaster areas? Where, where do you even start from? So the students always come up with these sophisticated answers. They said, we have to do an assessment, and we have to build collaborations, and we have to see what other, everything. They're, they're right. They're absolutely right. But before that, and, and I asked this to high school students in the Jewish school, uh, school here in DC two weeks ago, and they said, you look for survivors. I said, you're right. And, and, and in most cases, unfortunately, in Santa Rosa or in the tsunami in Japan, we couldn't find anyone alive. In Japan, people who were in this 120-foot wave of tsunami, very, very few survived. But every once in a while, we have the, the luck or the faith or the skills or everything combined 
to actually find survivors, and one of these stories was in Nepal. So as I told you, I speak Nepalese, a very useful language, and, um, and, I, and I went to the earthquake 36 hours after. And um, right after I landed, and I was the first one from Israel on the ground, right after I landed, there was a second earthquake. And the second earthquake, thank God, didn't kill anyone, but the airport was, not, was shut down. So we had a serious problem because we had a search and rescue team from Israel ready to deploy 15 of the top rescuers, but they could only make it to Nepal in the morning of the fourth day. So very late, because we know the first 72 hours are the most critical. The chances of finding anyone alive beyond the first 72 hours are really you know, close to zero. But I spoke to the chief of the Nepalese army that I knew from before, and he pointed this one building. He said there was a hotel, a five-story hotel, where according to his sources, there were still 22 people buried under the rubble. And this is this building. So we went there, and our civil engineers picked a spot, and they started to drill, and we started to pull out people. But we couldn't find anyone alive. In the first day of our operation, we pulled 12 dead bodies. In the second day, we pulled additional nine. So a total of 21. But we couldn't find the 22nd missing person, and they thought they probably made some, you know, they miscalculated or something. So we asked the local community if there was still anyone there they couldn't find. And they told us there was one lady. Her name was Krishna Kumari. She was 35 years old. She had two children. And she used to be the cleaning lady of this hotel. So we decided to continue digging. And in the morning of the sixth day, about 130 hours after the earthquake, we used a very small microphone, it actually looks a little bit like this mic, um, that uh, we call a life detector. And this is a very sophisticated mic that could recognize very subtle vibrations, such as heartbeats and, and human breath. And we put it into this hole that was about 15 meters deep, and, and the commander of our team was listening with his massive headphones, and he told me he hears something. He said he wasn't sure, it could be a cat, it could be some bricks moving, but it could actually be this last person who might have survived. And, and, and then he asked me to do something really weird. He asked if I could crawl into this hole and, and scream something in Nepalese. He knew I spoke the language. Now, of course, I was terrified because, you know, I was crawling there. I'm not a rescuer myself. I was in charge of the team. But I knew that if I moved my hand in the wrong direction, the whole thing could collapse, not only on me, but on the rescue team that was behind me and potentially this, you know, last survivor. So when I reached the deepest point, I screamed something that might sound a little weird to you. It goes like, Yaha ko ko hununcha? Yaha ko ko hununcha? It sounds like gibberish, and, and, and it's actually a little bit of a funny story. I, I was telling this, this story at, at Harvard, I think, and, and one of the students was Nepalese, and she started to laugh. And the other students looked at her, why are you laughing in such a dramatic story? And, and she was laughing because what I wanted to say was, is there anybody in there? But I was so overwhelmed and so stressed with the situation, so I ended up saying something like, uh, excuse me, is there anybody in there? You know, way too polite for this situation. Um, but as I told you, it's a story of miracles, and, and really unbelievably, down from the bottom, we were somehow able to not only recognize the movement, but this lady was actually able to make a sound and she was whispering the word dukcha, dukcha. Dukcha, in free translation, it means it hurts. I mean pain. So she survived for six days without food or water. She was the last survivor of the earthquake. And after two months of intensive treatment, that's how she looked. Thank you. And that's how she looked today. How are we with the time? Have like, over? Okay, so just one more minute to share with you another story. One more minute, literally. In Greece, we all worked on WhatsApp. Hi, Shoam. Um, and every time a boat full of refugees came, we got a message on WhatsApp that a boat came and, and we got the details, elderly, disabled, um, pregnant, others. And one day we really got a message that a Syrian pregnant lady arrived on the shore. Now, our team that day was Iris, a Jewish-Israeli doctor, and Malik, a Bedouin Muslim nurse, and they didn't take it too seriously because they seen thousands of refugees. So they asked, they texted back, how far is she? The volunteer from the other side immediately called them screaming and said, 
I can see the head. <laughs> That's how far she is. So they rush there. It's a true story. This lady arrived on the boat. Her water broke as soon as she reached the shore. That's her head right here. And, and the delivery was conducted on the spot. And thank God the baby is healthy. And after a few weeks, the family sent a picture of the baby with his older brother when they made it to Germany. And they told Iris, an Israeli Jewish doctor, that she's like his second mother. And, and I think this is really the essence of what I want to talk about. These terrible tragedies are very, it's very important for us to be there, not only because it's the right Israeli thing to do, it's the right Jewish thing to do to save lives, but it's also an incredible opportunity to build bridges and to change people's perspective. And we know how important it is right now more than ever. Thank you. Toda. Thank you, Yotam. Uh, I would like to invite our uh, last speaker for today, Moti Kahana, the founder and board of directors of Amalia. Uh, everyone has a light inside them. We always say we should be light to the nation. I think every human being has something in their heart. You, you saw the last two presenters. Something triggered you to do something in life. Uh, Yotam Nepal, of a basement in Tel Aviv. And in my case, was Yad Vashem. It just happened to be 2010. Until that point in my life, I was in business. And I visited the Holocaust Museum when I realized my family was not killed by the Nazis, as I was told. My family was killed by the, by the government of Romania in the city of Yassi. And that really affected me. Uh, at the same time, the Syrian revolution just started. It was no war. People was holding sign. We won democracy. I thought democracy was a good idea. I still do. And I entered Syria, not Homs. I went to Aleppo. Uh, that's what Syria looked like in 2011. Uh, just normal, basic country with Israeli always worry about Syria. The Syria hate us, we hate them. It's kind of a very mutual thing. To me, Syria was just a regular, any other country in the world. This is Syria today. Oh, let's jump. I need your help to, you know, with like some technicality issues. This is Syria today. Uh, if you get this thing up there. Uh, this is like two years ago. <clears throat> Why is... uh, if it's not working, just don't worry about it. Just uh, jump to the next one. Uh, Syria had 23 million people in Syria in 2011. Syria today. Five million refugees in refugee camp outside of Syria, seven million internally displaced, half a million are completely murdered. In my opinion, the number is much, much, much higher. And out of 23 million people, 11 million people are not there. They're all in refugee camp outside of Syria or internally displaced inside Syria. Now, what's that to do with Israel? You know, it's the next door neighbor. It's happened to be 100 meters from our fence. The, 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 the closest town to Israel, it's only 100 meters. Now let's see if the next movie will work. It's close to midnight in the Israeli-occupied Golan Heights, just a few hundred yards from the increasingly dangerous Syrian border. A team of Israeli soldiers is preparing for a special operation. It's potentially dangerous, and it's the first time they've invited journalists to witness anything like it. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do it. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do it. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do it. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do it. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do it. I'm not sure if I'm
להקשיב, מה שנקרא, לרכשים משמאל, לרכשים מימין, מה שנקרא, הערנות שלנו זה מה שיציל אותנו. Now, the Israeli was doing what they're doing under the radar for about almost five years, uh, helping the civilian, uh, helping most of the people were civilian, but many of them was fighter. We came in as Amalia. I started my journey in Syria in 2011. My focus was always inside Syria, never outside. And from 2011 to 2016, the Israeli was doing what they're doing, as you're seeing in the movie. Uh, kind of under the radar, in darkness. Uh, over the years, you heard some news of Israeli helping out as military Israeli. But what happened to the civilian? Nobody really was talking about the civilian. Uh, five years into the war, the Israeli approached me and said, let's do a, kind of like an area which will be a safe area. And by the way, it's not the Israeli created the area. It's the people of Syria having a good neighbor such as Israel created by themselves we're calling it a safe zone. It's an area the civilian of Syria can be within that combined area and be protected and safe themselves. It's the people of Syria protecting themselves. It's not the Israelis' involvement outside of helping to rescue lives. We looked at the civilian side of it. And we said, OK, what's needed in that border Israel? Well, the number one is definitely the medical part of it. People are dying, not within that. 17 villages. It's outside of the 17 villages, which is only 15 kilometers from the Israeli border. But the inside the villages, we needed clinic, medical help, because by the time the injured get to Israeli, they will not make it. And we then focus on building clinic inside Syria, education inside Syria, and food to bring into the area. But the number one goal was medication, Saving people's lives, that was the number one goal. And this is what we decided to do. Oh, this is actually the food part of it. We actually started with food supply. When the UN could not get supply into the area, we took supply into Syria. This was the first time an Israeli NGO, American Israeli NGO, publicly took supply into Syria. אנחנו נמצאים בנקודת הארכון של עמליה לקראת העברת הבשר שנמצא פה מאחורינו לצבא, מטרה להעביר אותו לעם הסורי, אנחנו נמצאים בעיצומו של חג הקורבן, עיד אל תושבים בצד השני לא אכלו בשר כבר הרבה זמן, אנחנו חושבים שזו תהיה מחווה חשובה עבורה. You have one ton here. Yeah. It's one ton of meat. One ton of meat. How much did you pay for this? How much did it cost? Ten thousand dollars. My name is Roberta Bonazzi. I'm the executive director of the European Foundation for Democracy. I've been working with uh, Syrian refugees. Actually, I've been working with Syria and on Syria for a long time. It's now nearly 12, 13 years. We've been very concerned with the issue of uh, um, humanitarian aid. We've been following very closely how uh, the issue of how international aid are located or ends up in the wrong hands and uh, the, the suffering that uh, so many people go through. So we have to cover the faces as some active military guys. We are working with them. We are working we actually brought supply of kosher food, just for the record, was actually kosher food into Syria. And then we started more supply going in. As you can tell, uh, it's only a year later, and it's amazing what's happening right now on that border. Let's go to the next one. <clears throat> 
it's a day clinic. You to take him for the day. You take care of them, and you you unfortunately send him back to Syria. Let me tell you one thing. Those people is a kid like you. It's someone like you, which like to play soccer and enjoy life and, and go to the theater or the movie. If we don't care for them, don't expect one day if something happened to us, somebody will care for us. People contact us via Facebook, and via social media, and they say, can you help us with this type of a problem? That's how we find. I'm gonna show you the phone right here. It's not only WhatsApp, you have a Viber, you have a lot of Facebook messages. You know, I see the faces of the people coming in. It's a daily hope of, oh my God, this is 60 years, those neighbors are my enemies. And some Syrian told me, who is my enemy, who is my friend? Is the one which killing me, my government, or my neighbor which saving me? Biggest frustration when somebody came back to me and said, "This not." Oops, technical difficulty. But you got the point. Uh, a year later, we started. We did a pilot program. Get three buses into Israel. Is hospital now? It's 600 kids already visit Israel. <clears throat> Supply. You can see the number up there. And really, where are we going from here? You know, it's you're talking about. In my case, was seven years later. A uh, few months ago, in Houston, we had the Oricon. Happened to be in 2012, I have those fuel units you're seeing on the lower right side. Uh, I was in the gasoline business. And I, had the, I still do have, not the business anymore, but the units, some of those units, which are solar power uh, gas station, portable gas station. Now in Houston, nobody had gas. Usually after Oricon, people don't have any gas. I put on my Facebook, I'm going down to Houston to donate some gasoline. A Qatari friend of mine sent me, he said, how much money you need? The Qatari actually funded the whole operation, um, some business people out of Qatar. And I say, I'm going down there. A bunch of my Syrian friend, which is in 2011, told me, we hate you, Israel, but thank you for helping us out. Today was willing to come down to Houston with us. And we went down to Houston and Florida, and we donated that, that gasoline to people needed it. We did it as Israeli, with Israeli flag, by the way, on those trailers, an American flag, and Syrian with us together doing it in the US. And on the upper right side is a school we have in Idlib. We have another school in Aleppo, and now we're opening a few schools on the southern part of Syria, border Israel. The left side is Greece, when we really never held outside of Syria, really focused inside Syria. But you Israeli, some of you Israeli in Israel was so wonderful last year when they really wanted to help and donate supply into Syria and a lot of supply was collected in Israel to give to the people of Syria. But there's a limited amount you really can take through the border. There's, you cannot take all that supply and Israel was overwhelmed with supply and we then took it to Greece and that's the left image on the left side. This is where we are today, as I explained. Uh, my, our focus was continue our work building within that border Israel. And 25% and of the time, it's taking the, you know, the same friend which told me originally, I hate you, but thank you for helping us out. I don't hate you anymore, he said to me a few months ago, but I don't love you yet. You know, it's a step, seven years later step. And that's it, that's where we are today. Those are the images, thank you all. And especially thanks to two NGOs over here which touched the light in them. And oh, each one of you up here, I'm sure you have something within you which will get you to react. Whatever it is, just do it. Trust me, best, best thing ever. Not to give you money away, that sucks but to help. <laughs> Mati, you're welcome to stay. I would like oh. to invite uh, Dr. Ekanati and Yotam to join us. <laughs> For the very last few minutes of the session, 
thank you, dear speakers. That was actually fascinating. I hope I'm not challenging you too much when I'm uh, posing the next question. So there are so many good things to be done and things that are going on. Some of them sometimes are even off radar. We don't hear about it. What I want to ask you is how those uh, doing good initiatives can help us bring the Jewish people together today. Can be an instrument in creating a relevant global 21st century Jewish identity. And I'm sure each organization will have its own angle on this or thoughts that he would like to share, but I honestly believe that this uh, lies in one of the core challenges that we're facing today as a people. So, Dr. Ekanati, would you like to start? Okay. Um, as I mentioned in my, in my TED talk, I think there are similarities in the, in the problems, uh, the social problems that are in Israel as well as in the United States. We both suffer from, uh, uh, from great social gaps and we, we both uh, have to cope with this issue. Um, and uh, we have developed a model that uh, I think that uh, can be also applied and helpful here uh, to solve uh, similar issues. Of course, it will need a translation and adaptation and all of that, but definitely it can be, it can be a way to, to build collaborations and to see how this model is applied here. I think we can also use a lot of help and input uh, from organizations here, be it uh, academic institutions who develop educational models or be it uh, uh, foundations or other NGOs that work on similar issues. And I'm a great believer in collaboration and uh, in, in building really a collective impact in order to, to attack an, an issue in the, in the, best, uh, in the best ways. Uh, there is a lot of wisdom, experience, goodwill, uh, need to do good everywhere, and, and I think it can be uh, one issue that we can collaborate, that we can collaborate uh, around. I can go into more details, I don't know if this is the stage, about how we can connect our children with children here, and how some American students that come to Israel can be role models or teachers uh, with our organization and how we can uh, create all kinds of uh, common meetings between children from here and children from there. So they learn about the real reality in Israel, that it is not all startup nation, there is also the rest of the nation, and this is what we are dealing with. So I think it can be a basis for a beautiful collaboration and for a mutual commitment to fight a common, a common goal and a, and a common issue. I also want to take one minute to emphasize that uh, we left here some brochures and, and, uh, and cards in case somebody wants to take them and to go more in, in depth into it. Uh, our director, Hannah, is sitting right here and we will both be very happy to speak with anybody who finds a, a, an interest to get involved to help in any, any way. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Moti. As I did not do my homework, as usual, ask the question again. How can doing good initiatives can serve us as an instrument in strengthening the Jewish people and create Jewish identity of the 21st century? Ah. Uh, when I enter Syria, as I said, people hate us. They really do. We, by the way, hate each other. The Jews of the Israelis do not know Syrian. Syrians do not know Israelis. And, and the issue was, is how you start working with those guys, how you working with people which really don't like you. Uh, my comment was to the other side, because they always think you're Mossad. You know, you're doing what you're doing because you're Mossad. And if you Google my name, the Israelis say I'm actually CIA. And I'm no Mossad, no CIA. And, and that was the comment. How you actually overcome trying to help someone as a Jewish Israeli. And last name Kahana, go figure that out in the Muslim world. And, and I said, you know, and all, if you in this room, and you Israeli or Jew, or both, it's in you. And I said to the other side, I'm not doing what I'm doing because whatever agenda you think is in your mind, that's who we are. That's who we are as Jewish people. That's who we are, period. And I'm doing it because that's who I am. You can love me, you can hate me, it does not make any difference to me because I know who I am. And that's what I decided to do it because we, all of us in this room, if we like it or not, that's who we are. And if there's a crisis, and 
you know, education, whatever the issue, and we can step up and act, we, you know, it's, in our, it's inside us as Jewish people. We just need to do it. Thank you, Mati. Yes, Dan. I, I actually think this is one of the most serious questions um, that we have to deal with, uh, both in Israel and here in the US and, and in other Jewish community. And, and I think for those of us uh, in the audience that actually live here in the US, you probably know that we're, we're facing a big problem. A lot of the young people are asking them a lot of serious questions about their, Israel, their connection to Israel, about their Jewish identity, about their connection to their families and to their communities. And I, and, um, and I think in Israel, we don't really realize these issues so much. It's, you know, for us, being Israeli is just who we are, myself being a secular Israeli. But I spent a lot of time in the US in the last two years and speaking in a lot of campuses and communities. And, um, and I really see that this humanitarian work, these global social justice issues from refugees to humanitarian crisis, natural disasters is really the thing, the issue, the number one issue that young Jews care about right now. So we realize it's again another opportunity for us to build bridges between Israel and the Jewish communities around the world. And we started to initiate different programs. So right now, we're taking a lot of American young professionals to our work around the world. We, work, we have 270 staff, about, and, and we have a similar amount of Israelis and Americans. And, and also local staff in each of the countries where we work. There's another very exciting program that we just launched the last summer they call the Israel Humanitarian Fellowship, which is for college students to join, uh, to join our teams on the ground for two months of intensive internship <coughs> in all these countries. And then when they go back to campus, they are best ambassador. And Jake, say hi. Jake is one of our interns who goes here to um, University of Maryland and, and went this uh, last summer to Nepal and is now organizing incredible events in his campus. Not a pure Hasbara event, but actually an awareness raising campaign to raise awareness both to what Israel is and Israel is doing, but also to the global social needs in each of these places. So I really think through these issues, Israel has so much to contribute to the world and young Jews, um, young and young at heart, not only young by age, are really, really care about these issues. So, so I think this is an incredible opportunity, especially now, and then we're trying to address it. Thank you, Yotam. Um, <laughs> we right there, ran out of time, but I'm gonna finish up with a, a very interesting quote by a very interesting person named David Ben-Gurion. Uh, the Hebrew will follow English, and the, the Hebrew was so pretty, I couldn't just mm -hmm. overlook it. So it goes like this. אחדות הגורל של המין האנושי, ההולכת וגדלה בימינו, בעקבות התקדמות דרכי התחבורה והקשר, that's before Twitter, right? הופכת סתימת הפער למשימה אנושית כללית, ומטילה חובות על העמים העשירים, המפותחים והמתקדמים, לבוא במלוא יכולתם לקראת העמים הדלים, הנכשלים ומעוטי היכולת. And the English one? The unity of humanity, which today is growing quickly, due to the advancement in infrastructure and communication, has made closing the gap of inequality into a general human mission and places obligations on rich and developed nations to provide for the need of poorer, weaker nations with less capabilities. When he said that, he meant that the state of Israel is the needed country and the richer state should come and provide for us. Amazingly, we live today in a world where the state of Israel is a state that can help and provide other countries. This is quite amazing, in less than 70 years. <laughs> we at Reut believe that Tikkun Olam, those amazing initiatives that we've learned more about, only three out of hundreds that we have in Israel today, is an important instrument in bringing the Jewish people together today. Uh, Yaakov, my colleague here, can send you more information about it if you're interested to read. Thank you for being with us. Have a great conference and looking forward to seeing you later today. Thank you to the speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.